If you'd like to talk about your own Bigfoot encounter, or if you're looking for help from a Bigfoot investigator in your area, email me at bigfootcrossroads at gmail.com. No Sasquatch were harmed in the recording of this podcast. Hey, this is Robert Dominguez with Bigfoot Club Podcasts. Robert, welcome back to Bigfoot Crossroads. Matt, thank you so much. Matt, is it okay if I call you Matthew Reginald Nappers? <laughs> you may call me that. My my new uh, internet legal, name. My legal new internet legal name. name. <laughs> <laughs> my, my official podcast handle, Matthew Reginald Nappers. For people who don't know, uh, Matt was on our show the last two weeks, and uh, Stephen decided to call you Matthew Reginald Nappers. I don't know why, but I just wanted to say that. So there you go. Hey, it stuck, you know. What can I yeah, say? Yeah, I like it. I yeah. like it. So makes me sound very uh, important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Very diplomatic. Very debonair. Yes, very much so. So you just got back from Mineola. I just got back yeah, I just got back from the Southeast Texas Bigfoot Bigfoot Road Show in Mineola, Texas. Why do they call it a road show? Uh, apparently, the Southeast Texas Bigfoot Group, they, they do a show all over Texas. I think, like, most recently, the one they did last year was in Huntsville at the Huntsville Prison. I want to – hopefully, I'm not – I'm butchering this, but they did it at the Huntsville Prison – um, where they do the the bull stuff? What's what's that called? That's uh oh yeah, the prisoner rodeo thing. Yeah, the prisoner rodeo. So they've done it there all the time. So I think they've decided just to start moving it around different parts of Texas. That's kind of a cool concept. It is. It is, and the way they had it set up, I really really liked it. They had it like in the in the middle of the town square, and where it's like cobblestone. And they blocked off both both corners of the street. It was probably like I don't know. It was maybe like 200 yards, and it was uh, it was right in the middle. And like their the the theater was right in the middle where they had the the conference. And so it was really really neat. They had Avengers like in the street, and also across the street in uh, this annex. So it was kind of neat. Yeah, I saw some photos you posted online, and it really had like kind of a block party slash street festival feel to it. It seemed. Yeah, the only thing it was missing was probably music. They didn't have music going, which was, you know, you kind of don't want music going whenever you're doing a conference anyway. So because you have speakers and they're going to be talking and possibly playing some evidence. So they probably don't want that. But I don't know. I kind of thought they could have had some music, but that's just me. So I mean, you could have started singing. Yeah, of course. And then there would have been nobody there. So, <laughs> so, <clears throat> but it was interesting. It was an interesting show. I mean, uh, I didn't. I didn't listen to all the speakers per se. I was there for, you know, when you and I talked off show, I was there mostly to interview people and try to get their experiences uh, with, uh, regarding Bigfoot or the paranormal and try to get them to open up and talk to me. Cause that's usually where you get like, like all the juicy stories is at conferences. So did you get any juicy stories? <laughs> yeah, actually I did. I got, I got like half, I think I got like 14 interviews. I think half were paranormal and half were like Bigfoot or, I got a couple of dogmen, which I was really, really surprised. I, I rarely get dogmen, like uh, I witness reports and stuff. So I got a couple of dogmen. So that was kind of interesting. I know you're going to want to share these stories on your own podcast, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, right. <laughs> but like, can you, you know, maybe touch on a few of the better ones that you heard that day? There was uh, the one that the one that kind of kind of grabbed me that I that was really really good was um, whenever I got there I got there really early I got there early like around seven o'clock they didn't they didn't open the, the theater until eight but the lady that was doing uh, the MC and her name was um, Annie Annie uh, Wills and she actually opened up the theater for me so I could go in because they were I had I had heard like stories that that theater was haunted it was like a hundred and two euro uh theater and so as soon as i walked in 
I actually got a, like a really strange vibe, like, you know, like, uh, like kind of like anxiety a little bit. And I walked in there and I, it just felt kind of heavy and I walked in there. And so it has like the, you know, your basic theater set up, it has a stage. Uh, the screen was kind of like off, uh, past, past the stage, like 10 feet back. There's like three rows. Uh, the center row was like, probably had like, you know, 15 to 20 seats a- across and the side, the sides probably had like five each, you know, on the rows. And so I got in there, I pulled out some gear, uh, some paranormal gear and I started running a uh, spirit box and I put, uh, I, I had like three K2 meters. So I put those out and it was kind of interesting to like, like to do it. Uh, I was listening really, really close. I didn't hear a lot of stuff cause there was like a lot of activity going on uh, like, uh, uh, outside. And so I didn't really get a lot of, I initially got it whenever I walked in there, but there was like a couple of voices in there and I think they were outside. So I, I kind of, whenever you do that, you kind of like toss it out. I don't really think it was, uh, any kind of voices I picked up, but I was too many talking like, like outside, but that was kind of interesting to me cause you know, I had heard stories about it being, you know, haunted. And whenever I got there, I initially had some feelings, but you know, I didn't come up with any evidence and stuff. So that part of it, I really enjoyed. Uh, and there was uh, some continuous stories that I heard from uh, George Jones. He's a caretaker for the theater there. And he owns like a shop or, like across the street. And the shop that he had was, um, it was an old funeral home, like, you know, in, in the early years. And so now it's like a shop. So he tells me that there's a lot of paranormal stories in there and there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's like a little girl that like braids hair or pulls hair. So it was kind of interesting. I wasn't able to go and in, in, like into that store because there was, you know, people shopping in there. So I wasn't able to do that, but, um, I had that. And then I got a, I got a couple of dog band stories from a gentleman and it was, uh, it was in Texas and it was like, I have never had a dog band story. So apparently he was talking about, uh, that this dog man was like eight, eight foot tall and it was like pretty high and it had like pretty good canines and it had like the snout and the ears pinned back, which is kind of odd. Cause you, you rarely hear that, you, you know, whenever, cause whenever I reared, whenever I read dog man stories, they usually hear uh, about the ears pointing up. And, but he said these ears were kind of pinned back that he noticed it. And so, and he said it was a male, and that it, its legs weren't as, you know how they, a lot of people tell stories about dog men, about their, their hind legs are like a regular dog, but standing up straight, right? Right. And so he said this one was not, they didn't have the hind legs, they just had regular legs. And uh, he said the foot was a little long. And I, th- I thought it was kind of interesting. So I'm actually editing that one today. So I'll be, I'll be submitting those on, on my own uh, podcast. I'll be trying to release it tonight. So uh, I was pretty excited about those. So, do you remember what area uh, this dogman report came from? Uh, you know what? I think it was. Uh, I want to say it was for some odd reason, Matt. Most of these, like the stories I heard, that like the two stories he gave me, and I, I heard I had overheard someone else talking to another person about Darb, and I wasn't able to interview that person. But it was all West Texas, which was kind of eerily odd to be. Yeah. It was like like the other side of Fort Worth, uh, the other side of, of um, Palo Pinto County, which is like two counties away from Dallas. So all that stuff, you know, and it was just kind of odd. Because normally I – because like to me, I would always think that dogman stories are misidentified stories of Bigfoot. And I would always – think about east texas whenever that would come about but to me that was kind of odd yeah that is um it's interesting the description that you just gave is very similar to a report i took years ago from a kid uh right after he had a uh, a horrific sighting of sorts that you know just absolutely terrified him as a kid um Mm -hmm. but he also described basically a Bigfoot with more of a dog or canine like muzzle and mm. not the pointy ears on the top of the head. Like most dogmen reports have, like you said, mm. um, and that was over actually outside of Jefferson, kind of East of Je- Jefferson, Texas. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for years, uh, in the Bigfoot research world, all these dogman reports were really just, People thought either a mistaken Bigfoot sighting or mm-hmm. 
a, another type of Bigfoot that has like sort of a baboon type muzzle on it. But now dogman stories are all over the place, you know, and uh, I don't know, man. What do you think? I mean, are you still on the fence about it or? I am a little bit because um, I know like this gentleman that was telling the story, he looked like he was probably like in his uh, late 50s, early 60s. And when he saw this, it was like in, I think he was like 15 or 14 years old. So I would probably take it that he was probably uh, maybe mid in the, like in the mid sixties, whenever he had to had this encounter. And so, you don't. I, I mean, I know for myself, I don't get a lot of dog band stories in Texas. I'm sure they, they are some, but I don't get a whole lot of them. So I'm, Whenever I would I hear them, I'd, like I'd always chalk them up as like I said before. I, I, maybe they're just thinking it's a, a big, you know, they thinking it's a bigfoot sighting, but it's you know a dog. They're saying it's dog bad, but I I don't know, man. I don't I don't get enough of them for for me to be convinced that there they are dog dog man sightings to me. You know something? Uh, actually, I made a post about this on Facebook. I ran across an article the other day where a woman in Oklahoma was. Uh, reportedly killed by a pack of wild dogs. Um, mm-hmm. a, a tragic story. Whenever the police officers arrived, the sheriff's department, uh, her dog was actually standing over her body, guarding it. And I guess they had some trouble, you know, getting the dog to let them get close to the body. But mm-hmm. the sheriffs, uh, the deputies that arrived on scene, uh, they thought it was a stabbing case. They thought she had been stabbed to death, and it was actually the coroner who uh, said, no, she was attacked by uh, dogs, uh, multiple dogs, and that really struck me as odd um, because there's some distinct differences between stab wounds and a dog attack mauling. Yeah. And you would think that um, there would be paw prints, you know, obvious evidence of it being a dog attack and a mauling. I mean, think about how canines take down prey, um, mm-hmm. you know, ankles, wrists, arms, where you're trying Next. to block yourself. Next, tearing, ripping, pulling. I mean, I'm not trying to be graphic, but definitely right. different than somebody taking a device and stabbing somebody and just puncture wounds like that. And, Did they uh, say... Yeah, I was going to say, did they say anything about her dog, that her dog was damaged? or had Yeah, any yeah. I think, the, I think it did say in one article something about the dog having wounds as well, uh, which also struck me as odd. Now, I can see her, uh, maybe her dog got into a fight with the other dogs or the other dogs were attacking it, and she tried to break up the fight, and that's what happened. But mm-hmm. I'm surprised that they didn't go ahead and kill that dog. Um this pack of dogs that reportedly attacked the woman. Uh, wow. And it was also in a rural area. And I have to, I have to say, man, the kind of the first thing that came to mind was dog, man. I don't know dog why, man, yeah. but it just kind of, you know, the uh, discrepancy between stabbing and it being a dog attack. Uh, why did the cops think that it was a stabbing, you know, and the coroner point out that it was canine. That's just kind of weird to me. Unless uh, unless the canines were really really long and and they they thought it was a knife wound because it was just biting it biting the poor lady to death and wow but there should have just been I, I would think there would be more damage you know and claw right, marks right. and things like that that just don't happen but, with a stabbing like a biting down and the you know the skin being moved by you know you know multiple teeth and stuff like that so yeah. I, I don't understand that either. So I mean, I, I looked up, uh, I Googled uh, images of mm-hmm. dog attack victims, and man, it's gruesome. I mean, it's yeah. really horrifying what dogs can do to somebody. Yeah. Um, and I looked up images of stabbing victims, and it was completely different. Hmm. So I don't know. Um, a friend of mine, Scott Hayes, uh, listens to the show sometimes, and he saw my post, and he actually uh, was able to find the woman's address and post a link to a map of it, 
and it is out there and something could definitely be running around there and get to her property without ever being seen by humans. Can you, can you give out the County at all? Or? Uh, well, it, the report came out of New Walla, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I mean, this was reported on all major news, you know, organizations. So it's easy to find, just look, you know, dog attack woman, Oklahoma, and, right. and you can read up on it. Um, a little side note, this isn't the first time uh, dog attacks in Oklahoma are a very real thing, especially rural country areas and wild dogs. Uh, one woman was also victim to a dog attack several years ago. Um, this isn't a joke. She was killed by a pack of wiener dogs. That's horrible. Yeah. That's hor- That's horrible. <laughs> yeah. And the really horrible thing is there's 10 of them, but they were only able to find packs of buns that had eight. No, I'm sorry. That's horrible. I shouldn't say that, I shouldn't say that joke. The, the wiener dog attack really happened. There was a pack of wild wiener dogs. I don't know why they were all wiener dogs, but oh my God. she did get killed by a pack of wiener dogs, man. I'm not going to relish that joke. Yeah, don't. Don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do not relish it at all. <laughs> yeah. Um so what's what's the correlation of and I know you if you don't know this this is fine, but what's the correlation of dog man sightings in this area or that part of the of Oklahoma? Never heard Do of it. Do you know? Uh, um, but I've heard uh dog man reports coming right here out of Tulsa County. Wow. Uh, in the area of Tulsa itself. Which would be kind of weird if it was just one person, but I've actually heard a few of them. And I, this is, I, I don't know what to think about it, man. This is going to be a, a weird question, but is there is there a dog man database like that, like they are with with Bigfoot groups and no the BFRO? No, no, they're not. Not that I'm aware of. I don't even think. I mean, there's some Bigfoot groups that study dog man reports and stuff, and go out mm. and actively research dog man. There might be one or two groups that kind of focus on it a little bit, but I don't know how much work they actually do. Um, hmm. But the biggest uh, kind of database, it, it wouldn't necessarily be a database, but, uh, you know, Dog Man Encounters Radio with Vic kind of, you know, that's probably, yeah, he was that's the, probably the best source, you know. He, w- he was the first person I was thinking about. I was going to say Vic needs to do a database. He seems like a really, really good dude. Yeah, I've known Vic for years. He was one of the first people to start in on the Bigfoot podcast game. He, really? Yeah, he was a co-host to uh, Campfire Shadows. I do remember that one, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that was a long time ago. And uh, that was during the old blog talk days. Wow. And now he's <laughs> grown himself an empire. Didn't you start on Block Talk Radio? I did, but that was a different time and a different place. Right, right. But if you want to go to my YouTube channel and join the member section, you can access all those archives. Yes. That's what I was was building, too. (laughs) Thanks for that alley-oop. No problem. (laughs) So I I want to touch on something, uh, something that we spoke briefly about on your show the last time I called in under my, Mm -hmm. you know, pseudonym. Uh, Yeah. Recirculating photos. Yes. In the world of Bigfoot and the frustration that some of us old timers have with it. How often do you see it happen? Uh, You know, I will, I'll say this, you know, I'm because, you know, and I, you and I talk off show a lot and, you know, I was really big into the research side and for a long time. And I think I stopped in 2017 because my, you know, I, I hate to say, you know, I hate to say it this way, but my, my passion was kind of dropping with the Bigfoot community for a while. And then it's kind of, it goes up and down, you know, and it's, it's sometimes, you know, with like any other group, it's, it's just kind of negative at times. And so whenever I see stuff like that, it, you know, it, it kind of, it kind of bugs me that that uh, as a Bigfoot community, because I feel that we're a part of the Bigfoot community, that 
that stuff still still like that still happens and it's like with social media it's so easy to like to do because it's like a right click and then you're posting stuff and uh and then whenever you try to you know explain what this is then you get attacked a little bit and i i know this is not where we were originally going with this but it's just one of those things that you you hate to see it and i don't really like you know it kind of uh, disheartens a little bit about the community or something, but that's just how I see it on stuff like that. I just hate to see stuff like that, but whenever whenever you do try to correct somebody, you end up getting attacked. So it is disheartening, absolutely, and it happens all the time. That you know that that's a big problem that the community of Bigfoot followers, unfortunately, uh, the majority of it isn't people that have had encounters or experiences. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of there seems to be waves of new people that join every year every couple years or so and all this stuff gets regurgitated and you know people post old photos with new stories behind them so you have this yeah yeah you have this large group of people that have never seen the photos before and they just jump on it you know because everybody would like to believe that everybody's honest on the internet even though we know that's not the case. And in the Bigfoot world, I mean, I I would be doing it a service to say that only 90% of it's bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, easily, I, easily. I, unfortunately, that's the truth. But as people know, it only takes one sighting to be true for this thing to be real. And it does. I know my sighting was real, so I know it's true. However, I digress. The the photos, the stories, and stuff like that, it, you know, things on the internet disappear. I was telling somebody this past week, shout out to Blondie X if you're listening. I know you are. They were asking about some things, and this whole subject came up, and I was like, you know, uh, websites disappear. Domains expire. Uh, there's no way to go back and prove something to someone that you proved five 10 years ago, you know, hoaxes have been exposed. The proof has been shown. It's not readily available anymore. It's a lot of work and you have to do it constantly just to try and like, let somebody know the truth. And eventually it just comes down to the point. Well, now I'm just telling you this and it's just my word against theirs. And you want to believe that this is real because you don't want to feel that you've been duped by somebody. So you get mad and you're not going to listen to me and you're going to say that I'm just jealous or a hater or whatever. So I quit doing it, you know. Uh, I, I still do it from time to time on things that are obvious where I can just grab it. Uh, but for the most part, I, I gave up that fight because it just wasn't worth it. And it really doesn't do anything to getting the truthful information out there and trying to learn more about this phenomenon that we are so passionate about. Yeah, I have to agree with you a hundred percent. Cause like, it, it seems like your position and my position, I, I know I'm not speaking for you, but it seems like our position, we, we used to do research. We we're very, uh, there was a point in time where we were really passionate about it and we wanted to prove, or at least I did. I wanted to prove that Bigfoot existed. And so that time has come and gone. And now I'm, you know, you're a podcaster. I'm a podcaster and our, I think the world that I, I kind of take fully head on right now is it's, is that I try to bring people that I find is interesting or that are actually doing the good fight. And I try to bring them to the forefront and then expose them to the world by coming on to the podcast. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. And I know you're kind of like similar in the same way. That's kind of the reason why I'm, I've gravitated toward you so much. Cause like we, we kind of mirror like the same ideas and stuff like that. But like, again, I, I don't want to speak for you, but that's where I see we're at right now is that we, we try to bring people like good people into the light that are normally not there. So that's usually why I see it. Yeah. I mean, we were just talking the other day. I, I don't want to give out any information about who it was or the photo in question or anything like that. However, mm -hmm. Uh, we did discuss a photo recently where a person asked you to help them. They think they know where this photo was shot. They want to go there to confirm the photo. Right. People don't do that anymore. 
people no. get a claim or see a photo or a video or whatever, and they don't seek out the information to see if it's factual or not. They just accept it and then defend it. Uh, just today, a photo was posted. It was shared in a uh, Bigfoot group of a man uh, taking trophy shots. This, this is horrible. I don't agree with it. He was showing, he was taking shots of a hyena that he had killed, a large hyena. Mm. And this was reportedly taken in Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, obviously I know better, but there's been some hyena sightings in the United States, quite a few of them. So I don't, I don't doubt it. I wanted to find out the truth, you know, because there is possibly a cryptid out there. That's very much a hyena. So I did the first thing that I know to do. It's real simple. You click on the photo, right click on it, Google search image. It's that simple. The yep. first result that came back. This is a guy posing with these photos from his safari hunt that was guided in Africa. In one of the photos, he's wearing the baseball cap with the logo of the guide company on it. It was that easy to find. Yeah. Just a couple of mouse clicks. That's all it took. Nobody else had done this. So I did post that one, you know, to let everybody know, like, okay, well, this is a lie because it's being posted specifically saying this is so-and-so and they shot and killed this in Pennsylvania in this specific county. I don't know why people do that. I don't know why people want to lie and hoax and make stuff up, but they do it. Well, Matt, it's called it's called click count. It's called followers. They that's what they want. They want they want click counts. They want followers. They want subscribers. That's why they do. It. They want to they want to be the next big thing. You know, I'm not talking about Brock Lesnar either, but <laughs> so <laughs> but so do we. Yeah, you know, as, as podcasters, we want those subscribers and clicks and all that. But you know, uh, I also want to let people share their encounters. I, and like, you know, you can't sit there and call somebody a liar. You can't, uh, you know, do background checks on everybody that you talk to or, you know, let them share their encounter on your show or whatever. But people out there listening can, <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't have to believe anybody. I'm just saying that you should probably keep an open mind because I know I've experienced things that I can't explain to anybody and I don't expect them to believe it just because I say so, but I'll share my story with them. But whenever somebody's putting out actual evidence that you can look into and you can research, maybe you should just take a couple minutes to look for yourself and find out. And if you can't you debunk it, you know, then it, then it's usually pretty strong stuff. Did you get any, like any blowback from this whenever you posted it? Did you get any blowback from the original poster? Or? No, not not by the person that posted because they were sharing it from a different source. And whenever mm -hmm. I went to the source, I couldn't comment on it. Mm -hmm. They they were only allowing you know friends or whoever on their account to comment on the photos for some reason. Well, what do you know? It's just like it's just one of those things that you know because if you if they if you they were able to like respond to you know there was going to be negative and defensive or something like that because that's usually you know that's usually how people are now and whenever you we question them because I, I I can I can just say from the paranormal side because I know I do paranormal and I do Bigfoot stuff and I I have my own pen text group and every every time someone posts like one picture that just really you know, grinds my gears. And I, and I tell people all the time, I go, if you're going to post one picture of an orb or a shadow, do multiple pictures of the area. So we could, you know, d you know, determine whether that's a, like anomaly really, or that's just something like a hanger or, or it's like a, it's a coat rack or something, you know, it's casting a shadow or something. And I always want people to do that. And people, you know, they never do it and they get defensive and they get angry and, and they try to call you out, and I just I just tell people, I say, hey, you know, this is about learning and and sharing experiences. It's not about you know sensationalism. 
I, I'm not about that. So I would always do that like in a paranormal side. I would always call people out and say, hey, come on, man, you know, post multiple pictures. If you're going to post a picture, do a bunch. So I, I would probably say that like in the Bigfoot side too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I see people post photos all the time in the Bigfoot world, and a lot of people post those pictures of a dark shadow standing inside the tree line. Um, okay, that's fine. Just go back and take another picture at the same time of day, you know? Yeah. yeah. Same location. See if it's still there. See if it's moved. You know? Walk over to it while you're standing there. Um, but people aren't interested in doing the research anymore. There's a, no. there's a few groups out there that I do commend for doing, you know, what I think is proper research where they're documenting everything. But for the most part, uh, you know, most people just go out and try to have an encounter, which is fine. But I don't think you should be calling yourself a researcher at that point. No, no, they're just like vlogging or blogging or whatever they call it like these days. But that's just kind of the direction everything's gone, you know. There's a whole new breed of people, you yeah. know. And I know when I was at the at the road show this weekend, uh, I was with uh, I hung out the whole day with uh, with Luke Gross, uh, the former director of the TBRC, and he was he was without me even you know <laughs> talking to him about it. He was talking about the new breed of Bigfoot researchers, kind of the same thing we're talking about right now. And how it just chaps him, and he doesn't like all these new uh, people who just don't put in the effort, you know. And that kind of the same thing where we're talking about now. So he was just telling me that, and I thought it was funny when we were talking about it. I thought about that, Luke, and I, and you know, he just—I don't know—he's just old school, like I guess, like we are. And stuff. But I remember when we weren't old school. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So I guess it's just the cycle, and it's just continuing, and. This is the the latest version of it. So, who were some of the people that you got to meet at the road show? I got to meet Philip Mendoza, uh, Big Dog, Random Podcast. I got to talk to him. Uh, he shared some ex uh, Bigfoot experiences that he had. Uh, I got to talk to um, James Polk, I believe. I, I probably butchered his name. James James Polk. Polk. Yeah, I I got to meet him, and he was telling me that he does paranormal and cryptid stuff, and he introduced me to a guy named Barry Brown, and he had some Bigfoot experiences, although I wasn't able to talk to him because he was just really busy doing stuff, and uh, I got to meet Josh Turner with uh, Paranormal Roundtable, so I talked to him for a little bit. Um, so he was I was actually listening to his podcast and your podcast way before I started doing, you know, a podcast like myself. So I got to meet him and, uh, he was really nice. He was really nice to me and, you know, gave me a couple of shirts and hats. And, uh, I think he was doing like a live and he walked over to, I was one of the first persons he walked over and say, you want me to say hi to his fans and stuff. So, uh, I did the, uh, honorable two sweet whenever he brought it up, you know, the camera, right. I got two sweet. So I, I, I did that. So I got to meet him. Um, I just met, I've just met a lot of, you know, just a lot of people, not in groups and, uh, on podcasts. And there was just a lot of people there and they were just, they were just interested. And I was asking a lot of questions because I was trying to get like a lot of interviews. So I was asking people, I go, I must ask like 10 people. I go, Hey, have you had a paranormal or a Bigfoot, uh, like encounter you want to talk about? And they go, Nope, I'm just interested in the subject. So I thought that was kind of neat that there, there was just a lot of fans there and there's, they were just wanting to, uh, talk to people and um and i will say this there was a couple there was a couple people uh they were fans of bigfoot club and they were there just to see me and i was kind of i I'm, I'm seriously i almost started crying so i was overwhelmed with emotion and and the people would walk up to me and goes hey i was here to, i came here like to meet you and talk to you and, and so i ended up taking pictures <laughs> with a, a couple fans and uh i was i was just really really honored that they drove all that way just to meet me and I didn't even think of it that way. So I, I, cause I still, you know, feel myself as a fan. I don't, you know, I, I'm a fan of a lot of people and for people to be fans to me, it was just, I was just overwhelming to be honest. And it's just weird that 
whenever people have a podcast and you know you have the listeners of the podcast it it's like there's a separation there but it's really not there's there's not a separation there yeah because like there's times i i forget i'm doing a podcast i just think i'm i'm talking to you and steven and i just like we're just because we talk all the time you know you and i you and i talk all the time and you know anybody that knows us knows that I call you, you call me, we end up talking a lot. And so a lot of times it gets, I get blinded on, are we doing a podcast or are we just talking? <laughs> so, but we talk so often and it's just like, to me, it's just a conversation. And then like when someone like, you know, comments on a show or, you know, they, they send me an instant message or a DM or something and they talk about the show and I said, Oh yeah, I guess I got people to actually listen. So, um, I don't know. It's just one of those things that, to me, to me, at times it's just it's, I'm uh, I'm humbled and it's, I'm overwhelmed sometimes, and because uh, I know, you know, I was listening to your show way before I was doing a show, and I was I've always loved your show, and um, I've always been a fan, and I was just happy just to be your friend. So I just decided one day, you know, I want to I want to voice my opinion because, like, you know, being being in Bigfoot groups and being in paranormal groups, you're kind of you're kind of hemmed down where you can't give your opinion about stuff because some subjects are taboo, right? Matt, and this is like, you just can't talk about it. So, or you can't talk to this group or you can't talk about this subject or you can't, you know, ex express your view on this kind of evidence. You just can't do that. So the podcast gives you, gives us, gives me the opportunity to, to voice my opinion about stuff. And so if I don't like something, I'm going to say, I don't like it. And if, and if I think it's, it's, you know, crap, I'm going to say it. And if I think something's good and, and people don't notice something, I want to emphasize on this. I go, this is really important. You should actually focus on this and this alone. And uh, so the podcast gives me the opportunity to talk to, you know, to tell people, hey, this is cool. Hey, this is, you know, not so cool. And this is just my opinion. So I kind of enjoy that. And I don't know why I got off on the subject. I was just, <laughs> I'm just talking now. No, I mean, it's all true. That That's the thing. You yeah, know, th this whole thing uh, started out as just even in the early days of, you know, doing a podcast back then we were just on phones. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, like calling into a place and pressing the button on the phone and it would start recording and put it out for us like there is no mics, no mixers, nothing. So like the devices have changed. But to me, it's still just having a phone conversation. You know, it's just having mm -hmm. a conversation with somebody absolutely but if i didn't have any listeners i would still be doing this i'd i'd still be doing the exact same thing yeah i you know i totally would too if i had 12 listeners i i you know i would still i'd still do it and i i, I don't know i'm just so passionate about talking about bigfoot talking about the paranormal or just talking about you know movies or shows that's just me but i mean okay for instance uh todd hell I've known him forever. Uh, mm -hmm. Never talked to him on the phone. Uh, this weekend, I talked to him for the first time for about five seconds. Um, I hope I'm not giving away secret information. Uh, Todd, if you hear this, and I am, I'm sorry. But whenever I called him, you know, Todd's with the Olympic Project. Uh, he okay. just recently featured uh, in Small Town Monsters, one of their documentaries about Bigfoot. And whenever I called Todd, he was like, oh, yeah, I'm actually out at the nest site. In the Bigfoot research world, the nest site is famous. It's like a huge deal. It's yeah. like back in the day, if it's not, you called somebody, and they're like, yeah, I'm, at, I'm standing here at the Skookum spot, you know, from the Skookum cast. Like, oh, my God. Yeah, I'm at Bluff Creek. <laughs> yeah, and, and he said that they had found some tracks, some small tracks, and they had cast one, and I'm just like, oh, that's so cool, you know? I was like, how far do you have to hike? Where is it? You know, like, all this stuff. And, like, that's how I feel whenever I talk to somebody who had an encounter. I don't care who they are. Yeah. You know? For an instant minute, we're, like, a fanboy. And so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, 100%. I feel that way every time I've talked to Luke Gross, and I've known him for years and talked to him hundreds of times. Me too. I, me too. He's 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 great. I, I love him to death. So I mean, uh, him him and Cassie, his wife Cassie, they're 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 great people. Even though I'm from Oklahoma, 
and I and I rib a lot of my Texas friends. I have to say, Texas has put out some good researchers, man, some good people in the Bigfoot world for sure. They, they, I, no, I, <laughs> you just went out to the field with Luke. Yeah, I did. Where, where'd you all go? We went to the Mineola uh, Reserve uh, Park Reserve, I believe it's called, uh, and we drove. Uh, it was like a a good. I think a good 11 miles in and then went off the road and walked in, got, got into a park, uh, park area. Now the, that park there does a really good job of mowing. I'll say that they'll, they'll mow an area that you can put your tent and camp out, but the rest of everything is pretty, a lot, a lot of foliage everywhere. So it's, um, uh, I think James, James Polk was, uh, posting some pictures of snakes. So, and I, I didn't actually, you know, I didn't plan on going out, to the woods because I was just wearing shorts and so I wasn't prepared. I actually, and you know my anybody who knows me knows that uh, I, I still have a hard time walking on regular pavement and like you know let alone terrain. So I didn't I didn't walk way deep into the woods and so I just walked a little bit. So, but it was really nice. Uh, uh, there were there were t- uh, Logan Craft was telling me about the the lay of the land and where they get normally get sightings and whenever the what time of the season. So it was really, really neat. So was, I hadn't been in the field in a long, long, long time. So it was nice to be, uh, you know, introduced by these guys that I just met and I was with Luke. And like I said, I haven't been with Luke in, in the field for a long time and I really enjoyed it. So it, it was great. Do you keep up with sighting reports? I do. I do from time to time. Uh, I, and I, you know, I hate to push this, but I look at the BFRO, uh, website from time to time and I, I do look at that and surprisingly enough there's people posting stuff on tiktok you know uh there's a couple of uh like audio stuff that i seem to find on tiktok and like i don't really look at the live of the videos because i know a lot of the videos on tiktoks are are just like you know for joke and you know funny and stuff like that but there's been a couple on tiktok that uh like at a truck rest stop that somebody was sitting in uh, at the edge of the woods and um and it was a couple of audio like some howls and stuff that i, I found kind of interesting so i do i do from time to time by chance have you read a recent report on the bfro site uh in march from michigan you know i it's funny that you say that i'm, I'm gonna answer no i did not but the last show that you were on uh, before you called in, Stephen and I were going to talk about it, and I was I had it pulled up, ready to read, and then <laughs> and then you called in, and then we were just talking about stuff. So I never really got to it. So. Oh man! Well, I'm going to steal your thunder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I happen to have ran across this report earlier myself, and there are some things that were kind of interesting to me about it. Um, one of the things that I found interesting was. The man who had the siding has a small amount of livestock on his property, but one of the things he has on his property is bison. Who has bison? This guy, apparently. Wow. Um, so he came home, and when he pulled in his driveway, he has a eight-strand barbed wire fence because he has bison. Um, you can't just have a regular barbed wire fence with, you know, three or four strands. If you got bison, you have to have a big fence. And, is uh, this the one, is this the one in, in Van Buren County? Yes. Okay. I believe so. Um, so he saw a Bigfoot creature on the other side of the fence in the woods. Um, he said that the hair uh, in the sunlight, the the upper por- portion of the hair was colored like a red fox with lighter uh, highlights and the sheen of blackish tips. It looked very well groomed, not matted, almost as if it was flashy. But as it bristled and turned its back, which appeared to be no less than four feet wide, the color of the animal seemed to blend with the foliage grayish color. Its motion was fluid, and there was no arm movement. I could not see its head or face clearly. That stood out to me about blending in with its surroundings and the hair being different color and stuff and the way that it worked with the light as it turned its body. Um, You hear a lot of reports of cloaking. 
Uh, mm-hmm. People saying these things vanished in front of their eyes. This may be an answer to that, or it may not. It may be something entirely different. I'm just saying that that's something that's interesting. I was just going to say this this report is incredibly descriptive. And when you read that off to me, uh, there was a there was an eyewitness report that I had on my show, uh, the Longview uh, episode. And whenever the gentleman told me that this Bigfoot like stepped into a briar patch like really really quick. He said, and he said this thing was massive. And then whenever it stepped into the woods, uh, these trees weren't very wide, you know. And so when he stepped into the woods, he said the woods swallowed it up. And he he described this Bigfoot as two Andre the Giants, shoulder to shoulder. Wow! Like it was at least two, and it was pretty wide. So when it stepped into the woods, he said he couldn't see it, but he could hear it, and he could he could see like you know. Uh, trees and bushes moving as as he was uh, shadowing him back to uh, his vehicle, and so when you read this when you read this to me, it it kind of made me think of that. So, and that always stuck out to me whenever he told me that that the woods swallowed it up. And so when you read this, I go, man, that sounds eerily familiar. Yeah, this guy, uh, he went, he did a little bit of work, and he went to where he saw it, and he found impressions in the ground that he said were three to four inches deep and about 16 inches long um so evidence that something was actually there big boy yeah and uh he also said that last summer he was clearing the same area and observed something like that moving through the trees but wasn't really sure what he saw and he has found uh apparently footprints in the dust on his porch before um which may explain some things because the biggest thing that stood out to me about this report four thirty in the afternoon on a bright, clear day, most reports happen okay. near dark or in the night, I, you know? Yeah. At dusk and dawn. Yeah. But he's found a report. He, you know, he reportedly had found tracks of this thing on his porch. I, I think this is one of those situations where the Bigfoot are watching his house and they knew he wasn't home. Yeah, I wonder how how far his house was to this original location, this original sighting. Yeah, I'm not real sure. Um, he didn't say like how far away it was from the fence or anything. The property isn't that big. I think uh, seven acres total. Mm-hmm. But yeah, interesting. Uh, Matt Moneymaker of Finding Bigfoot fame and the proprietor of BFRO. Uh, he's the investigator that talked to him. And he pointed out that near this property is a very tall ridge line, the highest point in the area, he said. And from that vantage point, you can clearly see all around, um, including this man's property. That is kind of scary a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> so, a little bit. So it's like he's he's checking him out, seeing where he goes, and dang. Yeah. he uh, Talk about it. He Talk said about that, creeper. He said this is 26 miles away from Lake Michigan, and that from that vantage point on a clear day, you'd be able to see Lake Michigan. Wow. Yeah. These things are smart, man. They are. Extremely smart. And I'm almost curious to see if this guy's going to – because this was this, this past year, right, this sighting report? just happened in March. I wonder if he's going to, like, do another one. I, like, maybe – I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. I hope he does another one. March, or he sees another one. March 10th, 2022, at 4.31 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, Daylight Savings. Wow. And, I mean, this guy gave his exact address. Um, you know, if you look up the report on the BFRO, uh, BFRO.net, I believe, like, there's even, like, coordinates to where the sighting happened, to where the creature was standing. I mean, all wow. the information's there. You know, nobody's hiding it. So that's usually a good sign. Yeah, it's off 79 Avenue, off a of country road, 669. Wow. Look at you. See how easy it is to do research? Yes. It is. <laughs> so. But no, the bison a, the bison thing caught my attention. And yeah. money maker. Jeez, I hate giving that guy credit. Me uh, too. Me too. But he did point out that there's no other livestock in the surrounding area. Like none of this guy's neighbors have any animals. He's got a mixture of horses, cows, and these bison on a on a spread of seven acres, 
And Moneymaker pointed out that the scent of manure would travel for miles from that location. And this thing might have been, uh, you know, attracted to the bullshit. I and just kidding. The the scent of manure, <laughs> though. Um, I'm always curious. Like, uh, so I, th- this is me thinking outside the box. Me thinking as a researcher in the past. I'm almost curious. I know it's not posted on here, but I'm almost curious if this herd or this litter. I don't know what what do you, you know. What do you call a bunch of bison anyway? Um, herd. A herd. Yes. A herd. Okay. If a herd of the bison had like a small calf or something like that, or uh, like an older calf or, or older older uh, male or female that this Bigfoot was looking for, you know, it has an opportunity maybe uh, to get some food or something. I was just wondering of that. So. Well, it is also spring. You know, right? Uh, mm-hmm. A lot, of, a lot of animals birth in the springtime, mm-hmm. so that may be going on in the area. Um, but yeah, this thing was probably looking for a meal, possibly, and had been staking out the property to see if it was possible. You know, that's I would say this. This is one thing that I miss about researching or being an investigator is that you know looking for different avenues or possibilities or on, on why because that's was like you know one of the things i used to always look at and luke used to teach this to me all the time okay if people see a bigfoot why is it there let's figure out why it's there let's look at let's look at lakes let's look at uh creeks let's look at livestock let's look at fish hatcheries let's look at gas right of electrical right of so he used to pump this all like into my head and so whenever you read this to me I almost want to go look at the the map of it and just kind of see close range and what's in that area. So that's that's one of the things that I miss the most about being an investigator, being a researcher and like Bigfoot is being able to look at stuff and figure out why it's there, why did the people see it, why it why it showed up, and that, that's one of the things I miss. Yeah, uh, you know, trying to solve the puzzle, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's the fun part. Um, the documentation and all that, it you know, people need to realize that you spend countless hours in the woods and you find very little, you know. Mm-hmm. And then whenever you do find something, it's a huge deal to you and you get all excited because you've spent all this time out there. And then you run back to the world and present it and they're like, well, yeah, it's kind of the shape of a foot, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. And then you get to look at it and you know they're right. You don't want to admit that, and you're like, well, look at the toe definition and the dermal ridges. And... <sighs> That's yeah. one of the reasons that I just decided to go, you know what, I'm just going to focus on podcasting and my own thing because, like, man, I was chasing my own tail, and it was all for nothing. You know, I would just say this. I, I Sometimes I think of us as we're like the Sports Illustrated of the- the cryptid world so we just <laughs> we just report it we just report what people are doing and yeah. how they're doing it yeah. and stuff so <laughs> so but yeah you're right i mean this there's there's long hours there's long there's a lot of long hours of driving uh finding the place uh writing your notes down and when you're arrived and like what phase of the moon is or what's the barometer uh and i would always find myself like writing note as i'm writing notes as i would draw like a little map on where we walked on or a trail or like a tree or a peach tree or something. I used to always do that. I used to, I used to draw like a little map on what areas we're walking and I would turn the page and start drawing some more stuff. And so I was always like really, really detailed on stuff like that. So it kind of, it's just like, it's just like I said, it's just a lot, a lot of long hours of, um, and especially if you have like video or if you're doing, if you put cameras out or if you put, you know, game cameras out and it's just a lot of work. And a lot of people don't realize that it's just, there's a lot of work. If you really want to do it the right way and, and you want to solve the puzzle, you just got to do it that way. That's just me. No, I agree. You know, I remember whenever night vision was at the top of the list, you know, like, Oh man, if I just had night vision and like yeah. the, the really well-funded researchers, they would be the ones that had the night vision. If you found somebody that had night vision, you wanted to go out with them so you could use it. You know, thermal mm-hmm. wasn't even an option, <laughs> you no. know, like not even on, on the, on the play field. Um, but we did know a guy that built one. <laughs> yeah. 
That was interesting. That was fun to carry around attached to a motorcycle battery. Yeah, that was that was really neat. Um, is that guy still in Bigfoot Research? Probably not. Or? Probably not. I haven't heard from him since then. Wow, that was that was a great night though. That yeah. we were together. Yeah, it was one of the one of the very few times we actually got to research together in the early days. So yeah, but you know, like you were talking about writing things down. You know, now we've all got computers that we take everywhere with us that record video mm-hmm. and audio. And yeah, use GPS and everything else, and nobody uses it. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like research could be so much better these days. The documentation and just maybe people are doing it, and I just I'm not in the loop anymore. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, even now, whenever I do, whenever I do like paranormal stuff, I'll I I still do it. Like when because I I still try to do research, you know, investigations and stuff. And so I'll, I'll usually just draw like an outline of the, the house. And I always do like a baseline reading for a K2 meter. And I just walk around and make sure that certain parts of the house are not spiking already before like, you know, activity starts. And so I was always used to doing that. Like in the Bigfoot world, I used to just write down where we're walking, where we put the cameras, where was the siding, how far was water, stuff like that. So it, it's just weird how, Times have changed. I know I haven't seen a lot of researchers. I haven't seen a lot of researchers show me what they're writing down. Not that I they have to, or I'm you know I'm asking for it, but you can always tell like the hardcore researchers what you know what they want to do and how they're doing it. And uh, there's some guys that are you know just really happy doing it, and there's some guys that are not so happy doing it, and you can kind of see it. So, well, I mean, it's really f- frustrating. You know, we're all trying to solve the same puzzle. Mm-hmm. And everybody's got their own pile of pieces. But for some reason in the Bigfoot world, if you're like, hey, man, let me see what pieces you got. Maybe, you know, they go with some of mine. Everybody's like, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not showing you my pieces. What's wrong with you? You you have your own pieces. Look at those. <laughs> and it takes all the pieces to put the puzzle together. You know? Yeah. You know, it, it's funny that you say that because, like, whenever whenever I talk on my show – when I was with the TBRC, we called certain areas like area one, area two, area three in Texas. And so if I talk about it now, I, I say what it is. I go area two, which is Sulphur Springs, Texas. So, so I end up doing that a lot. So, I mean, I'm not with that group anymore and I don't have to keep it a secret anymore. So that's just the way I look at it. Yeah. It, it Like I said, very frustrating. I'll just hang out over here with the crowd. <laughs> So speaking of paranormal equipment, you mm-hmm. talked about applying some of that equipment into the field of Bigfoot research. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah. I mean, um, cause you know, it's just kind of odd how, you know, cause I've interviewed so many people and Bigfoot stuff. And just now recently, and I know I did a show with you on another podcast and we talked about EMF and infrasound. And I've talked to, I've, whenever I talk to people in the paranormal, I mean, not the paranormal, but the Bigfoot world, they would indicate recently that they've got, whenever they were having a, Bigf- a Bigfoot encounter or experience, that they felt sick and they felt nauseated. And a lot of times whenever you, whenever I do a lot of paranormal stuff, that's one of the, that's one of the telltale signs of being overstimulated with EMF or uh, a paranormal, uh, uh, a spirit or entity that's manifesting uh, will tend to do that with someone that's having that experience that they'll they'll get nauseated and they'll get they'll get dizzy uh, they'll be lightheaded uh, they'll be you know they'll just be disoriented and stuff so a bunch of times whenever I would hear that in the Bigfoot world and I, that always like boggled my mind I go man infrasound and EMF sound similar what if they're both the same or what if they're both you know they're in both worlds. So that's, so whenever I go in the field now, I take, at least take me to, I take me two or three uh, EMF readers with me all the time. And so when I was in the field, I was walking around with one and some of the guys thought it was kind of weird, but I was just doing it. So I don't know. What do you, what are your thoughts on it? So sound, uh, including infrasound is a form of energy. Obviously mm-hmm. um, it is a type of, electromagnetic energy 
which the EMF detector detects. Um, obviously, you know, we're talking on a very scientific, you know, scientific -y, uh, mm -hmm. level right now. But if you put a list of symptoms you get from infrasound and a list of symptoms you can get from overexposure to EMF, they're pretty much identical. Yeah. They cause the same things, which I find very interesting. And I've started, you know, recently I told you I started looking into uh, cymatics, I believe it's called, you know, the geometrical patterns that show up from different wave frequencies from sound and mm -hmm. the effects they have on different substrates like, you know, sand, liquid, and some people have looked into it in the medical field and taken images of those patterns that come up in like on a cellular level in the human body. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting stuff. And it, it's something that I've experienced out in the field myself. Um, and I also know that it's an aspect of the paranormal and there's not really a reason why a biological creature would be putting out EMF. It doesn't make sense according to the science that we know. Um, at least not on such a large level that it would cause somebody else to feel ill. But that's why this thing is a mystery to begin with. Uh, mm. Let me pose this question to you. I'm going to say her name again because I like the fact that she leaves me nice comments. Blondie X asked me, do Bigfoot have ghosts? Yeah. What What do you think about that, man? Do you do you think these woods are haunted is a real thing? Like, <laughs> you know, are people seeing cloaking or are they seeing a Bigfoot's ghost just disappear? You know, I know because I, if we talk to like, for example, we talk to a, if we end up talking to Native American researchers, they're going to say it, that the the Bigfoots do have ghosts and they have spirits and and their and their spirits, you know, protect the earth and the water and the food source and stuff like that. And so I've always I've always thought that I said why not you know why wouldn't a, a, a Bigfoot have a spirit I mean it's 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 a living breathing animal and I know we haven't proved it, its existence but what, you know you know why would it not have one and that's I've always thought that and I, I you know I haven't beat it beaten it with like a drum or nothing like that but I've always thought of that all the time and I and, you know doing both. Bigfoot and the paranormal. So it's to me, I, I've always thought it was, it was, you know, possible of happening and people could see it and, and, you know, mistaken and seeing a Bigfoot alive when really it's actually dead and it's just a spirit. And that's why it could disappear so easy or get swallowed up into the woods. So. I mean, and regardless of which side of the fence you're on, I mean, whether this thing be a type of human or, a type of animal or whatever. I mean, there's well documented reports of people seeing ghost cats, ghost dogs, you know, mm -hmm. there's ghost animals out there. Um, whether you want to believe it or not is up to you, but I'm just saying like if Bigfoot is a type of animal, not saying it is before you send me hate mail, I'm just saying it could still have a spirit and it, you know, it could still be roaming the woods and that could explain a number of things that happen when people are out there. Mm -hmm. I will I will say this. There's been times when I've been out in Moyers, Oklahoma uh, with Kenny, Ken Marvel, and we're out on, on his property and we were putting out uh, cam trackers out to uh, kind of channel a Bigfoot to come to a certain area. There's been times where we've, we've caught like uh, full body aberrations out there, like a, like a head and, uh, shoulders and chest and just walking by and you know it wasn't clear enough to see what it was but you could see it was like a mist or like a smoke or but it was shaped like a, a head a body a shoulder and like a, a chest but didn't have any legs and i whenever kenny and i would look at this like we would just like look at each other and say man i go that's not bigfoot right that's not that's not bigfoot that's 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 paranormal right and we would we were trying to convince ourselves that it was, but you know, who's to say that, you know, that's, you know, a ghost of a Bigfoot walking by. Who's to say it wasn't a Bigfoot half in and out of a cloak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And what's I, that call? What's uh, that call? Woo? A woo? 
yeah, Wu Tang Forever. <laughs> Something. Sorry. Rick Flair says it all the time. I don't know. Yeah. And I just want to be clear to the listeners if you've stuck with us this long, by channeling, he means directing actual Bigfoot to an area, not channeling the spirits of deceased Bigfoot with the game cameras. Right. So, where can people find Mr. Robert Dominguez? If they go to www dot bigfoot club podcast.com or uh, i'm on all the social medias uh um facebook instagram uh twitter uh, if you just type in bigfoot club the number one and that's the number one so and you can find me so just that easy that easy it's just that easy you can find me at bigfoot crossroads.com or at bigfoot crossroads on instagram as always thanks for listening to Bigfoot Crossroads, Bigfoot's favorite podcast.